Cinderella was the title on the chalkboard marquee. Given the task of dramatizing a fairy tale for a teacher's conference, the kindergarten class decided on the classic old rags to riches tale, Cinderella. You know how it goes, shy of the protagonist, victimized by abusive step parents waits for wise matriarchal figure to rescue her and deliver her transformed from codependency <coughs> to bliss. In other words, if you're good looking, good at heart, and have a fairy godmother, you've got it made. <laughs> it was a good choice from the teacher's point of view because there were so many characters that every child in the class could be in the play. A list of characters was compiled as the class talked through the plot of the drama. There was the absolutely ravishing Cinderella. The evil step. The two, two wicked, wicked but stupid stepsisters. The beautiful and wise fairy godmother. The pumpkin. Mice. Coachman. Horses. King. All the people <coughs> at the king's ball. Generals. Admirals. Knights. And princesses. And, of course, that ultimate object of fatal desire. The prince. <laughs> <laughs> Who, if you recall, was only just a traveling salesman interested in pushing his line of glass slippers. <laughs> the children were allowed to choose roles for themselves. As parts were allotted, they were labeled with felt pen and paper and sent to stand over on the other side of the classroom until casting was completed. Finally, every child had a part. Every child except one, that is. One small boy. A child who remained quiet and disengaged from the entire selection process. Norman. A kid who was different. Not weird, mind you, just different. In the way he looked at things. Norman was always thinking. And like so many great but misunderstood thinkers, Norman was teased a lot by his classmates, forcing him to live on the fringe of kindergarten society. Well, Norman, what are you going to be? Well, I'm going to be the pig. Pig? There's no pig in the story of Cinderella. Well, there is now. <laughs> Norman did not relate to being a footman, or a mouse, or a pumpkin. <coughs> he knew his character, pig. And he was not going to give up his part in the play and go over and stand on the wall where a loser would stand. He intended, intended to fit in wherever pigs fit into the scheme of things without giving up dignity or identity. He took it for granted that there was a place for pigs in the play and that the teacher would know that. So what do you say to a kid who is already thinking up a costume of pink long underwear, pipe in your tail, and a paper cup for a nose? What do you say to an innocent little pig who doesn't see his career as an actor teetering on the brink of utter humiliation? <laughs> and what do you say to all the pigs, all those who do not accept the available boxes and pigeonholes? So, what did the teacher say at the moment? <clears throat> well, sometimes teachers talk more like fairy godmothers. So be it. Norman was declared the pig in the story of Cinderella. That's quite fine with the rest of the class. Nobody else wanted to be the pig anyhow. <laughs> and since there was nothing in the script explaining what the pig was supposed to do, all the action was left up to Norman. As it turns out, Norman gave himself one of the all-time best walk-on parts in the history of children's theater. He decided he was Cinderella's personal pig. <laughs> Wherever she went, he went. He made no sound. He simply sat on his back haunches and observed what was going on, like some silently supported Greek chorus. The details on his face reflected the dramatic action, looking worried, sad, anxious, hopeful, puzzled, mad, bored, sick, <laughs> pleased, as the moment required. There was no doubt about what was going on, and no doubt that it was important. One look at that pig and you knew. The pig was so earnest, so sincere, so very there. Norman created such dramatic tension that people who thought they knew the play was supposed to end began to have doubts. At the climax, when the prince finally placed the glass slipper on Cinderella's foot and the ecstatic couple hugged and rode off to live happily ever after, Norman finally made his move. <laughs> <laughs>
Cinderella was not the little girl with the button nose and blonde hair, but Norman, the dancing barking pig. <coughs> And I knew that the real fairy godmother was not the child waving her plastic wand, but the teacher standing, weeping in the wings. Kindergarten teachers know magic when they see it. Well, the kindergarten class had many invitations to perform their highly acclaimed production of Cinderella. Sometimes the teacher would have to explain what it was about the performance that was so unique. It has a pig in it, you see. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, the star of the show is a dancing, barking pig. But there is no dancing, barking pig in Cinderella. Well? There, there is, is now! Hi, good personals. It started as a note to my wife, and then I thought that since some of you might feel the same way, I'd pass it along. I don't own this story anyways. Charles Boyer does. Remember Charles Boyer, suave, dapper, handsome, king of the matinee, lover of the fairest women of the silver screen, as you could read in any fan magazine. But in real life, there was only one woman, Patricia. His wife, they shared a lifetime of laughter and tears. They were friends, companions, and lovers for 44 years. Then Patricia developed cancer of the liver, and so he stayed by her side day and night for six months to provide hope and cheer. But he could not prevent the inevitable, and Patricia died in his arms. <clears throat> Two days later, Charles Boyer was also dead by his own hand. He said he did not want to live without her. He said her love was his life. This is no movie, as I say. It's the real story, Charles Boyer's story. <coughs> judge how he handled his grief, but it is for me to say that I am touched and comforted in a strange way, touched by the depth of love behind the apparent sham of Hollywood love life, and comforted to know that two people really can love each other that much for that long. I don't know what I would do in similar circumstances. I pray I shall never have to stand in his shoes. Here comes the personal part. No apologies. But nowadays there are times when I stop to gaze at my friend, companion, and wife amid the routine of daily life, and somehow I the midwinter spiritual rot and a terminal cold she's had since September. Well, you don't ever get depressed, do you? Are you kidding me? There are times I get so low it takes an extension ladder to get me out. Well, what do you do? I mean, what do you do? No one ever pinned me down quite like that before. They usually ask what I think they should do. Well, my solace isn't religion, or yoga, or rum, or even deep sleep. It's Beethoven. I like to 
put his Ninth Symphony on the stereo, pull the earphones down tight, and lie there on the floor. The music comes on like the first day of creation, and I lie there, and I think about old Mr. B. He knew a whole lot about depression and unhappiness and that kind of stuff. He moved around from place to place, trying to find the right place, had a lousy love life, and quarreled with his friends all the time. Mr. B wanted to be a virtuoso pianist, and he wanted to sing well, too. But when he was very young, he began to lose his hearing, which is usually bad news for pianists and singers. <laughs> By 1818, when he was 48, he was stone-cold deaf, making it all the more amazing that he completed his great ninth symphony just five years later. He never really heard it. He just thought it, so I lie there, and I wonder if, if it could have ever felt to Beethoven the same way it sounds in my head right now. The crescendo rises. My sternum starts to vibrate, and by the time the final kettle drum drowns out all those big chords, I'm on my feet, singing along in gibberish German, and jumping up and down during the final moments of the coming of the end of the world, and God and all his angels. Alleluia, alleluia, woom, kaboom, bang, Lord. Uplifted, exalted, excited, and affirmed. Man alive, out of all that sorrow and trouble, all of that frustration and disappointment, out of all that deep and permanent silence, he defied his fate with jubilation. And I'm not just going to sit around wringing my hands in my winter ash heap in the face of that music. Not only does it wipe out spiritual rot, it probably cures colds, too. <laughs> Someday, some long day from now, on some incredible December night, I'm going to rent myself a grand concert hall and a mighty symphony orchestra, stand on the podium, and conduct the ninth. And I will personally play the kettle drum part all the way through to the glorious end, while simultaneously singing along at the very top of my lungs. And in the awesome silence that follows, I will bless all the gods that be for Ludwig van Beethoven, for his ninth and his light. Man alive! <laughs>